LaFontaine called my college thesis book the best scientific guidebook he'd ever read, uh, which blew me away. And I asked him if I could put that on my <laughs> on, on the book cover. And uh, so to to get a little bit of a nod from them when you're 21 years old was was just uh, really really great. That was Jeff Morgan telling us about some of his biggest mentors and f- uh, big influencers over the years. This is episode 120 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. As we approach the OP Steelhead trip this year, I am looking for a few interested uh, people out there who want to connect for the next trip. If you want to uh, find out more information on how to find potentially a steelhead of a lifetime, head over to wetflyswing.com slash OP. In today's episode, I talk with Jeff Morgan, who breaks down fishing small streams. We talk about Jeff's books, uh, including one on oddballs, his favorite South Park skit, and how to find big fish in small streams. We hear about the far side of entomology, a course that received high honors and was a big influence on his path. Plus, we find out how this course and his fly, Who's Your Daddy, landed in Playboy magazine. Don't miss this one as we hear why Jeff is a anter- is a anti-hopper dropper guy when it comes to small streams. Since 1977, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal has long been considered the Angler's Magazine, with original how-tos and technical articles written by the best trout and steelhead anglers in the West. FTJ is committed to sharing exceptionally written essays, fiction, poetry, and in-depth guides to fly fishing destinations. FTJ is one of my go-to magazines, and if you haven't checked it out recently, you can get started by calling 1-800-541-9498 or heading over to the web at ftjangler.com. So, without further ado, here's Jeff Morgan. How's it going, Jeff? It's going great. Great. Uh, great to have you on here. We, uh, we're going to jump into a little bit on uh, small stream fishing, and you've written at least one book on that topic, as well as, I know, the, the oddball. The, we're going to get into kind of some of the information on that book. But before we jump into all the small stream stuff, can you just talk about how you first got into fly fishing? I was kind of born into it. Um, my dad fly fished since he was a kid and, uh, you know, we grew up in Portland, Oregon. So it was an urban environment, uh, pre river runs through it. So fly fishing wasn't a huge thing amongst, uh, my friends or anything like that. I was kind of the only one that, that did it, but, uh, you know, we were, I, my earliest memories are, are from Crane Prairie when, when they had lots of fish, uh, going up to Timothy Lake, uh, near Mount hood. And, uh, and tying in, in my dad's little basement tying den that he had. I think I think I was uh, the earliest I was actually on the water. My mom has a picture of me at about uh, four months on the Deschutes with my dad on in a backpack. Nice, so nice. So you've been doing it quite a while. What and is Crane Prairie? Does that not have as many fish anymore? Well, I mean, the whole bass issue uh, has radically changed it from when I was a kid. You know, in the early '80s. Uh, not knowing what I was doing, uh, just watching the blanket hatches and not being able to cast more than 20 feet and still being able to pick up, you know, three, four or five pound rainbows, uh, to what it's become today where it's much more challenging. And, and a lot of the prey sources have been depleted and, and it's kind of a sore spot with my, my father, cause he, he notified ODF and W about the bass there in 1982. Uh, and there was no kind of public reckoning about the bass until the late eighties, uh, and even then, the Department of Fish and Wildlife really didn't uh, do the best job trying to suppress the population. So uh, right. uh, the dragonfly population collapsed, uh, and some of the other large prey forms had been depleted severely. So oh, yeah. uh, there's still there's still plenty of nice fish, uh, but it just isn't it isn't like the good old days. Not the same. Okay, and and yeah, there's some other lakes out there too. The uh, what is it? I guess Davis Lake I think has uh, some some bass fishing now too as well, right? Yeah, you know Davis is his been a, a boom and bust late for both trout and bass, you know, it depends on water and depends on two each of populations and, and everything, the bass kind of threw an extra wrinkle into that whole, uh, dynamic there. But, uh, you know, some years it's, it's an amazing bass lake. Some years it's an amazing trout lake and sometimes there's just not a lot of water. Yeah. And what did your, uh, what, what did your folks do for a living? Uh, my mom was a high school uh, health and physical education teacher in Portland Public Schools for about 30 years. And my dad actually started off teaching and 
uh, during the, the hard economic times of the late 70s, early 80s, he transitioned to uh, Malarkey Roofing and was a was a mill worker uh, at first, and he's kind of worked his way up, and he's just about ready to retire now and uh, probably spend more time fishing, but he's been with them over 40 years now. Oh, wow. Nice. Okay, and, and, you're, still, and you're still out in the Portland area? Yep. I uh, have kind of bounced around the West uh, since high school, but uh, I'm back in Portland and, and look to be here for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. What, what are you, so in Portland, what, what keeps you coming back is just, uh, you like, you like the rain? <laughs> the rain is conducive to, to fly tying and riding, which are two things I enjoy doing. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, I got a lot of family here and, and, uh, so we're, uh, yeah, we're pretty happy, uh, in the Portland area. Okay. And what you know, you said fly tying, uh, and writing, uh, I guess we could start with the writing. Can you talk about, uh, the books that you've published so far and when, what, what those are about? Yeah. So, um, gosh, my writing, I, I was a horrible writer as a kid. Uh, I had a, I always would get B's. You know, I was a pretty, pretty good student, but I, I couldn't get above a B in, in English. And, uh, my 10th grade English teacher, Mr. Ivers, uh, told me to write about what I was interested in. And the only thing I really cared about was fly fishing. And so I write fishing articles and, and that or write fishing stories. And that's all I did. And eventually he said, Mr. Morgan, if you promise not to write any more about fishing, I'll give you an A for the rest of the term. Hmm. So, uh, uh, that kind of got me going. And, uh, when I was, went off to college, at university of Montana, my freshman year, uh, I was kind of homesick. And so I started just kind of writing memories about, fishing in the Oregon Cascades. And when I got to Oregon State, um, the OSU Honors College requires a thesis at the end. And so I asked the dean if I could write a book about fly fishing in the Oregon Cascades and kind of root it in science and and talk about how to market a self-published book. And and uh, they approved it. And so we went ahead and did that. And uh, so my first book was actually my senior honors thesis at Oregon State. So the Angler's Guide to the Oregon Cascades. Um which uh, I had Scott Richmond of Westfly fame and, and a spectacular Northwest writer in his own right. He uh, was an advisor for that project and he hired me on at Westfly, which uh, I worked with uh, between undergrad and grad school. And uh, during that kind of couple year period, I, I put out two books, one on small stream fly fishing and one on kind of aquatic entomology and fly tying called the oddballs. So uh, yeah, yeah. So that's gotcha. my, Gotcha. Big form writing background. Okay, yeah, and Scott Richman, his name has come up a couple times. I just heard, I think it was last month, his uh, the Westfly he took down off off the internet after after many many years. It seems like that was a staple of the West. Do you know much about that whole story? Yeah, no, uh, Westfly was something that Scott started. Uh, Scott was a retired um, engineer, and uh, he had written a couple books that were really influential for me. Um, just the casual style with which he writes and, and really good information. Um, there's been lots of guidebooks written about Oregon and a lot of them probably could have just been uh, written by looking at a map. Uh, but he really gave him a, a personal touch. And, uh, and so he started Westfly um, right about the same time when I asked him to be an advisor for my project. And um, he, as soon as I graduated, hired me on to write some entomology stuff for him. And, and we really were trying to expand the website uh, early on. It was a for-profit uh, back in the halcyon days of the internet when everyone, you know, if you, I don't know if you're a South Park fan, but there's a yeah. great South Park uh, underpants gnome skit where, um, you know, step one, steal underwear, step two, question mark, step three, profit. Mm. And uh, that was kind of the way the internet was back then. You know, we have a great idea. Don't know how to make it make money, but we expect to make money on it. And uh, it was just uh, tough to turn Westfly into a profitable venture, but it remained a nonprofit that was pretty important site for a lot of people. And and it's hard to believe that at one point it was the biggest uh, unique viewed fly fishing page in the U S Yeah, in the late 1990s. Uh, Oh, Uh, so that's the late. And when did it start? When did it, it started, it start. well, no, I, I take that early 2000s, but it, it started in the late 1990s. I, I want to say 1998, but yeah. I'm not, so, we'll right, have to right. get Scott so, on so for you. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I definitely would like to get him on. So yeah, 98, and I remember that time because that was, uh, let's see, not too far before that is when I first heard about email, you know what I mean? So, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that was way early on if, if we're talking the first of early email and stuff. And what happened? Do you know what happened to all the, the, 
the uh, the rep- the articles on the site? Are they are they just gone? I don't know. You know, I found out from my dad that it had shut down, um, and I have no clue. I probably should reach out to Scott myself and find out. Yeah. What's going on there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was an interesting thing. I, I reached out to him and we kind of chatted on email and. Yeah, that we've had that conversation now a couple of times because it's one of those things that's interesting. I've had that conversation here. We've I've talked to Martin, the global fly fisher, and you know, lots of people that have been around for a long time online and it, you know, I asked them what what's gonna happen to all that information because it would suck to just see it just disappear, you know. No, it's it's a great resource. Um, you know, flying time tips. Um, you know, we had a huge amount of entomology that we put up. Uh, so it was a great bug resource, um, for people that wanted, you know, a, not like crazy scientific, uh, analysis, but certainly a lot more than, than what you get on a lot of sites. Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. Well, I'll have to leave that for the next time I chat with Scott and see if he can get on here. Um, okay. So well, the book and what was the small, um, streams book you wrote? Yeah, it was small stream fly fishing, um, it was originally small stream fly fishing revisited because the idea of the book was to, uh, take a, take another look at small streams, um, which there hasn't been a lot written on, at least when I, when I started that project, there've been a couple books, uh, written about small streams, but, um, you know, most were about the aesthetics of fishing in small streams, you know, just, it's kind of a fun yeah. place to go and relax and get in touch with family and, and Girac wrote a really great small stream book. Um, but I kind of wanted to look at it more analytically than, uh, than had been done in the past. Okay, cool. And well, we're going to dig into a little bit. I mean, maybe just start us off first on, I guess, just the size. You know, what what is when you say small streams? Is that the same as small creeks? And what are we talking about for size? Well, it, it's all relative. I mean, basically, uh, you know, a small stream could be anything from that you can straddle uh, up to you know thirty feet, forty feet across. Uh, but but it's more. It's not the physical size of the stream. It's more of like kind of what we dismiss as marginal waters um and dismissing them as marginal waters based on their size um and that's something that my perspective on small streams is was always shaped by uh, my experiences in yellowstone where you've got a, a whole bunch of very very good streams that don't have you know famous names uh and nobody really thinks about them too seriously because they're not big yep they're tributaries <laughs> and, uh, to the, they're tributaries, tributaries. To those. yeah 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 Gotcha. Okay. So, so that gives us a rough idea of the size and, and what now in your home, I mean, do you have, are these mostly streams that nobody would really ever hear of? I mean, they're, they're like you said, they're tributaries of the ones we know of, right? Yeah. I mean, the book really isn't about a, a guidebook to particular streams. It's more about kind of the philosophy of, of approaching a small stream, uh, seriously. And like, you know, the, the reality is big streams, may or may not produce big fish small streams may or may not produce big fish what what produces fish and growth is is the fish eating more food than it needs to spend to obtain that food and that that theorem holds whether the stream's three feet or 300 feet across and so um the principle of the book really is to get people to think about hey where can i find streams and then where can i find spots in streams where that theorem that you know fish needs to eat more than it spends to stay in place uh fits gotcha. and, and that's where you're gonna find quality fish yep okay and which species are we talking about here i mean i guess it can be anything but is it are we talking uh, everything including brook trout yeah it, yeah and actually i do cover brook trout in, in a section of that um but in Oregon, we have very, very few streams with, with brook trout, and, and oftentimes there are sections of streams above a lake. Um, you know, we are in the process of trying to eradicate any brook trout in streams, period, simply because uh, where they are, they often compete with bull trout. So, okay. So if somebody um, was picking up, picked up your book, would it be, you know, if they were on the East Coast, would, would it be helpful for oh, them? Oh, totally. Yeah. The, the principles would totally apply. Um it, in that situation yeah i mean it applies to a lot of the research that i did for the book besides you know obviously getting out fishing hundreds of hours in small streams uh was looking at, at studies in, in other parts of the world um you know reading about streams in, in england and in europe and canada new zealand um just trying to to gain a wider perspective to see what holds across most small streams okay Oh, good. So this is, uh, yeah, it applies pretty uh, liberally. Then, um, yeah, maybe we can just start us off talking a little bit about 
you know, I guess I have a picture in my mind of a stream, a small stream I'm thinking about. Can you just talk about how you approach, you know, how somebody would approach a new stream they're going to and how they might, you know, read the water, or find some fish and kind of get started? Yeah, I mean, the the first, so a big problem in Western Oregon is we have a million small streams. <laughs> I mean, you just look at a map and it's just like water, water, water everywhere. Uh, so how do you tell which stream is going to be productive and which one's not before you even drive to one? Um, and so using maps is a really important resource to just get you on the right type of stream, uh, because small stream information is not something that's, that's widely shared. You know, um, people guard their, their spots pretty well and you can go to fly shops and, and ask around, but you know, small streams are not, yep. they're, they're not consistent and they're, they can be challenging to get into good fish. And so, uh, especially for beginners. And so if you're a fly shop, why, or a guide, why would you want to specialize in small streams? Uh, it just isn't good for business. Mm-hmm. And so there's always a dearth of information when it comes to, to small streams. So I always tell people, you know, the first step is knowing how to read a map really well. And, um, when I did my Oregon cascade guidebook, you know, you had to pick, you know, maybe a hundred streams. I think I have 110 in there. Um, but there's, you know, 2000 in the range that I'm writing about. So which ones do I, do I fish? And you simply need to look at maps and try to figure out, okay, does this lake have, or does a stream have, uh, a decent gradient? So it's not too, too steep, you know, streams that are super fast and super steep tend not to be good producers, especially in, in, in Western Oregon. Hmm. What, um, what would be too, what would be a gradient that would be too much? It's like a cascade uh, pool drop. Yeah, I mean, if if it's if it's gonna be all white water, um, I, here's an example. Um, and this is almost too well. I I won't dive into that yet, but um, yeah, if, if if when you look at a stream, it's mostly white water. Um, that fish is gonna have to spend a lot of energy to obtain whatever food it gets. So, um, but you just look at contour lines. You know, if the contour lines all around the stream are, are tightly packed, that means you got a steep gradient. If they're widely packed, you can guess that the stream's pretty moderate pace. Um, the second big factor is looking for springs or, uh, you know, lake inputs. Um, springs can moderate water temperature, um, throughout the year. They can add nutrients, uh, lake outlets, um, kind of function like mini tailwaters. Mm-hmm. You know, the, it regulates flow, uh, it, uh, provides a constant flow of nutrients. Um, you know, one of my favorite uh, small streams in Western Oregon is Salt Creek, which comes out of Gold Lake. And if you look at Salt Creek, it's a pretty fast stream, and which goes against my rule of, you know, high, really high gradient streams tend not to be great producers. But because it comes out of a, a pretty fertile uh, lake, Gold Lake, uh, there's a substantial amount of insect growth in there, and uh, more than than you'd expect. Size of uh, or number of fish that are you know eight, nine, ten inches and larger. Gotcha. Okay. And then, and then the spring, and how would you find the, um, the springs and things like that? Well, springs will show up on maps just as a circle with a little line underneath okay. them. Yep. And so that's, that's kind of the, the, you see, if you see 20, 30 of those along the stream, you can think, well, this, that might turn into something. And, uh, you know, that's the reason why Yellowstone is, is such a magnificent small stream destination, uh, compared to let's say glacier, you know, not too far away, but Yellowstone's a world's apart fishery. And it's because of the springs that you know, lots of hot water springs, but also a lot of cold water springs, cold water springs still can put in nutrients, still can regulate flow and regulate temperature. So, okay. Gotcha. Okay. That makes sense then. So I guess, yeah, let's, let's talk about, so you're approaching the stream, you know, say it's a, a 20 foot, you've, you've narrowed it down, you found some springs, maybe some productive areas. How do you, you know, do you approach it differently as far as reading water and finding fish than you would on a big stream? Well, Tom Rosenbauer wrote a book, his book, Reading the Water, talks about, um, you know, it, it's all about rocks. And on small streams, it's even more important. Um, rocks are kind of like your uh, your map uh, once you get onto a stream. But, uh, but before I do anything on a stream, uh, I watch. I, I, the number one problem people have with catching decent fish on small streams is it scares the fish before they even have a chance to cast to them. Um, yep. it, it, we, we have a fly on our rod, you know, it's, it all goes back to the, the small stream mindset, small streams, small fish don't need to worry about it. Right. Just put on a humpy and go out there and, and cast. And so we just trudge down the water and, and we go through the motions and we catch 
seven inch fish. Um, uh, any fish that grows big on a small stream has had to avoid predators its whole life. And, uh, to make it to four years old, it's, it, they've run the gauntlet. And that means when they see danger, they lock down, they, they yeah. get into hiding, they, they move into deeper water and they certainly won't take a fly. So, um, you know, being extremely patient is, is really a key, um, before anything else and, and observing the water and looking for rocks, uh, and then trying to figure out how to, uh, prioritize your spots. Hmm. Are, so, you, are, uh, you, are you pretty much sitting a lot of the times, I guess, depending on how much cover, but on your knees sort of thing, crawling up to some of these places? Yeah. Uh, a lot of my my fishing in small streams is, is done from kneeling position, um, crawling into position. Um, there's some places in, in Yellowstone, uh, little fireville river, which is a trip, which used to be able to fish a little fireville, uh, when the main fire hole would get too hot and the trout would move up into the little fire hole and stage in, in various deep runs. Cause it was 20 degrees cooler than the main stem. Uh, but those fish had seen <laughs> 50 anglers a day, uh, standing right o- over them, uh, you know, throwing grasshoppers at them. And so they're, they're just, as soon as they see any sort of movement, they're not going to, they're not going to take anything. And so you kind of have to crawl up on your side and, and lob a little package of, of tiny little scud nymphs and, uh, kind of check nymph your way through there and, and you can pick up some, some really nice fish. So yeah, I mean, it, it approach, careful approach is really, uh, the, kind of the second cornerstone after being patient and kind of observing the water before you, uh, get there, being careful and getting into, into position, uh, is also important. Okay. And what's the biggest, I mean, as far as fish size, I mean, you've probably either you've caught or you've heard of in some of these, I mean, can you just catch as big as you're going to find in some of the bigger streams? I guess it sounds like they're moving, turning into the, the smaller streams at times. Well, yeah, it, 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 there's a lot of factors involved. Um, there's some streams, um, yeah, I get, you know, it all just depends. It depends on, on, on a big fish is always a relative term. Yeah. You know, so, so on the big horn, you know, a big fish is, is, you know, six, seven pounds, uh, on a little stream on the Oregon coast, a big fish might be 12 inches. Um, you probably have the same relative abundance of the big, quote, big fish in each stream. So, you know, my goal is to try to catch the biggest fish, uh, yeah. on the small stream. So it, it might be, it might be 12 inches. It might be 14 inches and, you know, there's seasonal movements with spawning and, and migration, thermal migrations, because it gets too hot or too dry, water's too low, um, so yeah, there's a lot, a lot of variables there. Okay. And, and can you describe your book, the, uh, the small stream fishing? I mean, what, from somebody who hasn't picked it up yet and read it, just break it down, kind of a summary of what it, what it's all about. Yeah. So basically it's, it's throwing out the window, the idea that small streams are, are for small fish and small kids, you know, um, basically introducing that principle that I mentioned earlier, where fish's growth is totally dependent on how much the food the fish can consume depending and compared to how much energy it has to expend to stay there. And so trying to find places and small, find the right small streams and find the right places on those small streams and not screw it up by approaching poorly, um, is kind of the cornerstone of the book. But, you know, we go into the, the kind of the geology and the, the environmental factors that make up a, a good small stream. We cover small stream fly patterns, uh, small stream entomology, the bugs that you find on small streams, are very different than what you find on big streams. Big streams tend to be monocultures. Um, you have maybe seven, eight, nine uh, genuses that dominate ninety uh, percent of the biomass on a river like the Deschutes. Um, very, very limited number of of species compared to say, gosh, almost any small stream in the Oregon Cascades. I had a a great. Um, Entomology professor at Oregon State who uh, also taught Rick Hayfley and Dave Hughes. On oh yeah, and, that was Anderson, doctor, right? Doctor, yeah, Doctor Norm Anderson, and uh, and when I you know told him my interest in in bugs and that I was going to go to the Deschutes, he's like, "Why do you waste your time on the Deschutes? It's boring." <laughs> and uh, and so he goes, "The Metolius is so much more interesting," which is totally correct. And uh, so he tuned me into uh, uh, the diversity that uh, that small streams offer. Oh, cool. Well, which which means which also which also means that you know another myth about small streams that that haunts us. We think that they're they're dumb and small stream fish never get selective. But uh, you know you 
I found many, many instances all across the country where you're fishing a stream that might only be five feet across, but that fish only wants uh, a particular mayfly or a particular caddis. And if you're off, you're off. You're just, you're just watching the fish jump. Yeah. Yeah. What, uh, you know, Tom Anderson or, uh, or no, sorry, Norm Anderson, um, anything that comes to mind, you know, that you learned that was big, you know, from that, it sounds like, so you were under him in like undergrad or, or? no, I, I, <laughs> I was a history and economics major and, uh, environmental economics and environmental history, but I, uh, I'm, I'm a nerd. So I just knocked on his office door and, oh, yeah. and, and just started bugging him. Gotcha. And, uh, I had a, I had another, I had a great, uh, entomology professor there that I took a couple classes with uh, a guy named Rick, um, Eggert, who did a um, class called Foresight of Entomology. Um, f- super famous course. It was actually in the best college course in the United States by the Chronicle of Higher Education and Playboy. Huh. Uh, huh. Rare honor um, yeah. for, a co- for a college professor. But uh, he, uh, he was a great uh, entomology prof. And um, so I visiting him and then I, I, I he said, oh, you got to talk to to norm uh the one thing that norm really in, in, in kind of inspired with me was was crane flies uh the importance of crane flies uh in the trout diet both in in both the biology of crane flies in western oregon and then in the great basin huh. and how they how yeah. they differ in streams and lakes streams it, mostly in streams uh the my it, you know learning a lot more about crane flies and, and the history of, of using crane fly imitations in, in great britain um, kind of made me more aware and, and learn, I learned mostly about the lakes on my own, but, uh, he was really big in explaining the biology of, of how they operate in, in Western Oregon and Eastern Oregon. The big, the big revelation for me from him was that, uh, with the soil structure in, in central Oregon, central Washington, Idaho, um, it's very difficult for crane fly larvae to burrow into that and, and maintain their burrows. So a lot of the Crane flies are semi-aquatic, and they live actually under the substrate and streams, and um, and in the marginal areas. And of course, they're disturbed by wading anglers, wading rafters, floods, and things like that. And so, um, a place like the Kirkwood River uh, has been like my best place to fish crane flies anywhere in the country. Hmm. Um, a lot of a lot of people wading around, uh, moving their feet, kicking up crane fly larvae. And if you if you just kind of picked up rocks and you look at a rock, you'd never see them. They're in the root wads of all those weeds that are uh, kicked up by anglers. Nice. Have you been fishing the Crooked River for a while and recently too? Last time I was on the Crooked was last month. I try to hit it uh, at least two or three times a year, um, and it's always it's always in flux. You know, there's good years and bad years. And um, my favorite thing to do this time in in the fall is is just to put on like a size twenty two. Um, Griffiths Nat, and then maybe a size twenty six uh, midge merger of some sort, and just just cast to to rises, and uh, you catch a lot of small fish. Not not bringing a lot of big fish, but it's almost all trout, and it's it's really enjoyable to have a, a nice little dry fly afternoon at the end of the dry fly season. Nice. What's your take on the crooked over the years? Have you seen uh, some changes or how you know, things are going? It, it, it just seems like the changes have come more and more dramatically um, recently. Um, when I, I first started fishing, it, probably when I was, I think my 12th birthday, we were down in Bend in October, and my dad took me over there and didn't think much of it. You know, it was just this muddy river. I didn't know how to nymph at the time. And once I learned how to indicator nymph and later check nymph, um, that became a staple for us. We'd go down there every New Year's Day and catch... 50, 60, 70 decent sized whitefish and trout. Um, I haven't had those type of days down there with big fish, you know, over, you know, you know, 60 fish over 12 inches, uh, doesn't happen very often down there anymore. But, uh, you know, all I remember is, is I took my, uh, fiance on our first kind of fishing date and she's French Canadian. Um, so she can handle the cold wound down to the cricket on, new year's day about four years ago and the river was frozen all the way up to about a mile of the dam wow it was frozen over and there was anchor ice on there 
uh, because they cut the flows down to 16 CFS. Jeez. And I'm just thinking, what are we doing here? And of course, you know, the next year we have uh, another series of small fish because when you have anchor ice, you kill off a lot of the insect life. You don't kill the fish necessarily, but uh, you kill off the, in- right. the insects that are not in egg stage. So it just, it seems like there's some water management issues there, but there's a lot of conflicted interests. So yep. it's a compl- yep. complex situation. Yeah. It's interesting. I was, Oh gosh, I'm trying to think of the episode. Now we were talking about somewhere in, uh, in Denver. Um, what's it's the main run that goes through the folks that fish that really popular run out of Denver. And they were talking about how, and I think it was Pat Dorsey was talking about it. And he was saying how, there's, I mean, they, you know, it's for water, obviously they need water yeah. for the city, but it's also managed pretty well for fishing because mm-hmm. that's a big part of it. And yeah, I'm not sure if the, uh, the Crooked River is the same way. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't follow the politics of it. I, I probably should, should do that a little bit more, but, uh, it's, it's certainly not managed for the benefit of, of rainbow trout fly fishing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well let's let's get back to the um you mentioned some fly patterns. Can you talk about a few of the popular fly patterns that you know if you had to say you want to just grab a, a handful of some of the ones that might work around are there certain patterns or does it really depend on what what stream you're at? Are you talking about for small streams or Yeah, yeah, for small streams. Well, so my my number one priority with small streams is having a fly that if you let's say you're fishing trap flies, a fly that will float um but also be visible to you under a variety of conditions because you know if you're on a small stream you're going to have shade you're going to have you know sunlight you're going to have white water you're going to have uh pools so you need a fly that you can see um and you also need um something that's natural i think you know it's really fun to put on a royal wolf uh and just live and (laughs) ride and die with royal wolf uh and i love to tie him but uh uh, sometimes I like to have some more natural stuff in there. So my number one fly that I use is a fly I call a cascade flying ant. Um, I've been tying it for about 20 years now. It was actually 25 years now. It was a, uh, a very, well, it's a variation of, of Co- Randall Kaufman's flying ant. Um, and it's got black, uh, rabbit fur body, uh, actually hairtron body, brown hackle and grizzly tip wings. And, I call it tri-visible because it's got the black, which shows up in white water or in glare. It's got the uh, white, which shows up in shade, uh, the white on the grizzly wing. And then it's got brown, which contrasts with both. So you can kind of see it on, no matter what the water conditions are. And it matches something that's extremely common um, in the natural diet of, of Cascades trout. Uh, and it works great in, in the Rockies as well. Hmm. So I, I start with the flying ant um, as my number one kind of dry fly pattern. Um, and then the other big fly I like is I like my crane fly. I, I've tied a couple different, uh, dry deer, hair, um, caddis flies or excuse me, crane flies. And the reason why I like them is they float really well. You can see them, they're natural, uh, and they're big enough that little fish can't get onto them. And oh, so right. if you find yourself tired of, of unhooking six inch fish or, huh. or smaller, uh, you don't have to worry about that if you got one of these get bad boys on, because unless that fish is about seven, eight inches, it can't, uh, you know, all that hackle pushes it away oh, yeah. from the fish's mouth. What's its pattern? Do you have a name of, of something we could look at? Oh, dear hair daddy is, I, I, I have a big problem with naming flies. Yeah. Long story short, when I was a freshman in college, I was doing a lot of commercial tying and I tied for a shop in Montana. Uh, the shop owner asked me to come up with some stonefly patterns. And so I did that thinking, man, I'm, I scored a, a winter job. I'm going to be, you know, living large throughout uh, the snowy Montana winter. And, uh, all of a sudden I come into the shop and my fly has his name on it and was tied overseas. So that was all my right. introduction to globalism. So if you read any of my books or any of my articles, I give ridiculous names to my flies. My flies are all either named after Bob Dylan lyrics uh, pro wrestlers, sports things, you know, I just give silly names to it because, you know, fly flies are just, it's like folk music, you know, it's a, it's a step in a, in a process of innovation. So, yeah. Well, what's the, what's the craziest name you could, you have, you think of, you can, think oh, of? Oh, well, the craziest name is who's your daddy, which wasn't that that's a, a sinking dragon, uh, crane fly and, uh, a sinking adult crane fly yeah. pattern, which again, ended up in playboy. So yeah, how did that, how did uh, that happen? 
I don't know. I just got a call from one of my friends who said, uh, you have a fly in Playboy. I'm like, what? So that was like back in the early 2000s. And so, so Playboy, I mean, they have a, a fly fishing uh, section of their, uh, I don't, I don't, I, all I saw was the page that they took a picture of and sent it to me. Uh, and it just had like random things like that are, they're cool named, oh, uh, yeah. things or seductive names, I guess. So that's crazy. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, but I've named, I've named flies all sorts of crazy. A lot of my friends, I, I slip their names in there to flies. Um, so we try to try to keep it light. Yep. Yeah, that's right. You're not, uh, you're not quite. Although you've had it in Playboy, you're not on the Kelly Gallup uh, path of no. the, por- the poor no. names. Yeah, no, no. And now a quick word from our sponsor, the Fly Fishing and Tying Journal, your seasonal magazine covering fly tying, fly fishing destinations, uh, how to, short stories, and more. Here are a few examples of what uh, what is getting me fired up from the uh, winter d- edition of the FTJ. Check out a story by Deck Hogan on big flies for the OP. Perfect timing for our upcoming trip uh, for the OP. Get the inside scoop from Dave McNeese uh, down in uh, Southern Oregon and his technique on dyeing fly tying materials. We also head over to uh, the North Umpqua, then the Green River, and another story on the Green Butt Skunk from Gary Lewis. Kind of a history piece there on the skunk. I had Gary on the podcast as well in a previous episode. Uh, lots of additional content in every episode of the journal. Head over to ftjangler.com and subscribe so you don't miss any of the tips, tricks, and uh, stories in the next issue. That's ftjangler.com to get started today. And uh, tell them you heard uh, this ad on the podcast, and I'll find a way to make it up to you if you reach out to me at uh, dave at wetflyswing.com. Okay, let's get back to the show. Just on the mentor, you know, Norm, obviously, sounds like he was a mentor. You know, hayfully, I'm not sure if you connected with him a lot, but are there a few people out there that really helped guide, uh, you know, the the path that you're on? And it sounds like, I mean, you have the, the fly fishing books, but you do have a whole nother uh, section or, you know, what you do for, to make money, right. That's separate from the, the books and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've, I've done a lot of different things in my life besides the, the writing, but in terms of like the, the, you know, writing and, and kind of going down that path, um, you know, Scott Richmond was a huge, huge, huge influence uh, on me. Yeah. Um, Dave Hughes was too, uh, when I was very young, actually, Hughes and LaFontaine, um, Gary LaFontaine, Mm -hmm. um, when I did my first writing, both gave me very positive reviews. Oh, cool. Um, LaFontaine called my college thesis book, the best scientific guidebook he'd ever read, uh, which blew me away. And I asked him if I could put that on my, on on the book cover. And, uh, so to, to get a little bit of a nod from them when you're 21 years old was, was just, uh, really, really great. Um, and then I've had a lot of benefactors within the industry. Um, John and Shirley and Jack Hagen at Northwest Fly Fishing Outfitters have been, they supported me since I was in high school. My first job was tying flies and, and sorting fly bins for them oh, really? in high school. So, uh, they've been great, uh, for me for 25 years and I've been tying flies for them for a long time. Hmm. Uh, do you still uh, tie fly? Do you still tie flies for like a, I, yeah, I very rarely because obviously the market's very different than it was 20 years ago. Um, but the uh, I, I was still doing some special orders for some shops. I, I tie for a lodge up in Alaska that I've tied for since college, mostly because I get to tie a bunch of big, colorful flies, and I, I never do that. So mm-hmm. it's really it's kind of a break for me to get away from all my trout stuff and and play with uh, yeah some colorful materials, but. Uh, um, yeah, I don't do, I don't do too much of that anymore. I mean, the heydays of, of being able to, I mean, that's why I started writing. And then when, when writing turned out to not be very profitable, I uh, went to grad school. So, yeah. Yeah. What was the, what was the separation there? You know, you, you had, uh, you mentioned a couple of big people that mentors that gave you, you know, said you were doing some amazing stuff, you know, kind of, and then, you know, you'd look at the people that there, there's not very many, I guess, Dave Hughes, um, 
I'm not sure what Scott did. There was a few people I've talked to some of them on this show that made a made a life out of writing, flying mm-hmm. fishing, and fishing books and things like that. You know, was there a thing there where you kind of said, you know what, this is not going to be my full thing? Or were you kind of pushing for at one point to go kind of all in on it, and then you just said, well, it's not going to be there? No, well, it just I, I saw the the crisis in internet writing and and what it was doing to uh, you know, basically what you get paid to do yeoman work as a writer. Um, and it just didn't look too promising. Well, when um, you were back there at, back at the, uh, Scott Richmond days, which was like we were saying, it was West early, Fly. early to, yeah, West fly, uh, early two thousands through, well, I mean, he just closed it down, but really it was probably the first, the two thousands. It was really popular. Mm-hmm. really growing what like what sort of thing would you i mean you were getting a, a payment for writing articles through there is that was that an actual yeah, like yeah, similarly like, to if you're writing a magazine article yeah no he he, he was yeah i got a, i got paid just like you were writing for fly fishermen or fly no kidding. fishing and it was yeah it was, wow. it was great so he was so he was making some money at that thing. he was making yeah he was doing he was doing well um and uh, and he was probably putting some of his own money into it too. But I mean, it, it made enough that that was my that was my job. Um, I took I was taking some language courses for graduate school at the time. But I mean, uh, my job was was writing for Westfly and and going and, and pitching my my book and That's and amazing. times and flies. And so it was it was fun. You know, when you're 21, 22, and you don't have any responsibilities and yeah. and you can get out and fish all the time and it was great wow. um but i just didn't see that as a long-term right uh thing and and i you know i've always been interested in history and, and education and so i um i went to grad school to be a history professor and did that for a while no kidding what so, what, what yeah. sort of history so i taught um u.s history 20th century u.s history um my interest is kind of more in political and environmental stuff um so I, I did some research on kind of the evolution of the politics of sports hunters. Sports hunters. Uh, yeah. Like, kind of like, looking at like Teddy Roosevelt. and Exactly. Exactly. I was looking at how hunting kind of played into politics from Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, through about the 2004 election, looking at, uh, you know, the either mockery or, or just the, the, the odd nature of John Kerry having to, having to actually walk out and, and show his gun to, to prove that he was a hunter. Oh, um, oh right. You know, to, to, for Paul, and, and, and there's all these awkward photo shoots um, because just saying that he hunted wasn't enough. He actually had to have the gun with him. And, and it wow. seems like that, that has become, you know, more important within uh, kind of the, the political mindset of, of the hunting world um, compared to a hundred years ago where, um, it was, there was a whole bunch of other factors involved with, um, what made you a hunter and, and, uh, kind of the, the status that, that carried with it. That's interesting. Yeah. The hunting thing is kind of interesting to me. I actually listened to, I can't remember the name of the podcast, but it was this guy, you know, he does historical stuff and it was kind of a weird one, but he did Teddy Roosevelt did like a two hour thing on his life and, Man, I, I'd love to get I'd love to get somebody to, on to talk about Teddy Roosevelt. You know, maybe that's another show we could do. But you know, the interesting thing he talked about, yeah, I mean, how he was over there, how he loved. I mean, he was traveling the world, and I think he went over to Africa and killed like five hundred different species. And yeah, he, go, you know, go to the natural go to the Natural History Museum in D.C. and you can see a bunch of them. Yeah, that's, that's where they ended up. That's where they ended up. So I mean, some of that's for good, but some of it's kind of like, wow, you're, you're. I mean, he was just killing all sorts of stuff. I mean, if I imagine today, I mean, obviously with all the endangered species species stuff it's it's a different uh different place we're at now but you still see trophy hunters out there right yeah you still do you still do and you know back in his time a lot of people did that hunting um you you didn't have you didn't have instagram you didn't have iphones you couldn't just go out and take pictures of stuff you know you you had to in many cases you had to shoot it to to study it yeah you didn't have you didn't have guidebooks and, and photography was was a new thing and so uh, hunting wasn't just a, a thing of men. I mean, women that were interested in nature and, and um, you know, were out there shooting and field and stream had three columns by women in the 1890s. Oh, cool. Wow. Um, so it's, it, yeah, the, the history of hunting is, is very interesting. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's probably another podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. No, it's good. I, uh, Okay, well, let's see. Where are we at here? I was just kind of getting off in that. I, I get fired up a little bit when I start talking about hunting because I, I do a little, <laughs> bit of, a little bit of deer hunting still and um, probably some bird hunting if I had more time, 
Let's well, see. that's what fly tying is what got me into bird hunting. You know, I, one of the other things that made me interested in hunting is that I didn't grow up a hunter. My dad hunted a little bit, but he gave it up. Uh, he was a duck hunter uh, and pheasant hunter, but he gave that up when we were kids because Saturday mornings were that, soccer and that's baseball. That's exactly and, what happened to me eight years yeah. ago. Yeah. And, uh, and so he never did it. And, and he, you know, taught us how to shoot once, twice when we were kids. And, um, and I was in college and I was tying commercially and uh, funny story. I went down to, I was at Oregon state and I went down to the hairline, uh, yep. complex down there in Monroe. And I was trying to see if I could get a wholesaler set up with them because I was sure. buying so much material. And I saw the cages of rabbits and <laughs> I was like, this is like a bunny Auschwitz. Really? I had no. I mean, I, I it was an awakening moment. Was for it me a bad? Was it a bad situation? No, 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 no. It was just I just didn't in my brain. My these things came in craft packages. It wasn't animals. Oh, right? gotcha. Yeah. I, I and all of a sudden it really hit me that my God, I I am killing animals to create yep. these things. Yeah. And um, I from then on I decided that I needed to kind of be more involved in in what I was doing, more conscious and kind of aware of of my impact. And so, uh, I started duck hunting and bird hunting and, and that's pretty much all I do, but, um, hmm. and try to get out a couple times a year. And the great thing about it is you get all sorts of, especially if you're, you know, a duck hunter or, um, you know, you get all sorts of feathers that you otherwise wouldn't have access to. So oh, yeah. it's been a great boon for my, uh, stores of feathers. Nice. Nice. Yeah. I got, I have, uh, let's see, Let's see what episode we're at now. I'm trying to think now backwards. Uh, yeah, so Tom Whiting, uh, he was on and he talked about, yeah, I don't know if you know the Whiting Farm story, but that's a pretty interesting one. He, he's kind of come in and, and with his genetics has made mm-hmm. some of the best yeah. the best chickens. I mean, he talked about even this one that he went so far as to, it is a black uh, featherless chicken. Oh, geez. You know, he's basically he got the genetics too. You know, so he's got he's like a wild scientist over there, just doing all these. But but some of the he's got some of the best hackles for, for fly tying in the world. You know, so it's pretty. Oh, cool. it's amazing! It's amazing what uh, what they've done. You know, from, from a kid when we we're using little India capes and China necks and stuff mm-hmm. like that to to what you see now. It's I when I teach fly tying classes, I always bring in a couple uh, Indian necks and then show them <laughs> what oh, the really? wedding hackles and the Mets hackles look like now, and they're like, whoa. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's what 40 years of, of genetic engineering will do. <laughs> so you still do some uh, some classes and things like that. Do you do you spend a good chunk of your time in the fly tying and fly fishing space still? No, not really. I, I do um, demonstration tying at, at some of the events uh, throughout the Northwest, and I go and do the FFF clave uh, each year yeah. and yeah. sign some books and do some stuff out there. And um and I teach I teach a, a beginner and in intermediate fly tying class at Northwest Fly Fishing Outfitters. I've been doing that whenever I'm in town since I was a senior in high school. Uh, so it's kind of fun um, just to engage new tires and and I like to teach. You know, I kind of a teacher by nature, so it's um, mm-hmm. it's a really uh, fun opportunity to kind of introduce people to stuff and tell stories and and uh, yeah, just spread the sport. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it sounds like you've had a pretty diverse background. The history, that's definitely interesting. I wish wish we had a little more time to dig into that. The um I did want to touch on one other thing before we get back into uh kind of finish up that that small stream uh piece. The the oddball what's the book on the oddballs? Can you talk a little bit about the title of that book and what that's about? Yeah, so the the oddballs, I finished small stream fly fishing and knew I wanted to do something with bugs because I just really got I was really focused on bugs. Um and I was between undergrad and grad school. I had, you know, lots of time on my hands and I just threw myself into trying to understand the trout diet better. Um, because I was noticing that everything I was reading about stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies was essentially the same stuff from Hayfling Hughes's Western Hatches, yep. uh, Leaser, Leaser Stonefly book. LaFontaine's Caddisflies book. I mean, literally, I mean, beat for beat, That's I was right. reading the same stuff over and over and over again. And I'm like, are we just, is this like a game of telephone? Are we just, you know, saying the same things over and over and, and tweaking them a little bit? And then I'm reading other things about, uh, you know, leeches making up 50% of trout diet in lakes. And I'm like, you can't know that. 
because you can't leeches break down within in the trout stomach extremely quickly. Mm. So there's no way you're finding this. This author was not finding 50 percent leeches in in a trout diet. Period. Mm. Um, because when I sat down and I started doing the research for for the Oddballs book, the Oddballs book, I consulted over uh, 270 professional peer reviewed uh, uh, trout diet samples. Mm. Uh, and throughout the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, uh, New Zealand, Australia. And, uh, in all of those, all those studies, I found two leeches. Wow. Uh, <laughs> it's just extraordinarily rare for, for scientists to, to find them. So I'm doubting that, that, uh, that we're finding them. So anyway, um, the, I basically tried to write um, a new entomology, uh, but it was just too ambitious. It was too big. And um, I presented it to several different publishers, and they're like, yeah, we really like it, but we, we can't do a 650-page bug book. <laughs> yeah. um, nobody's nobody's going to do that And uh, with footnotes because um, <laughs> I footnoted everything, wow. um, mostly because of, of stories, like I said before, where you get these random stories about, yeah, this was a sample, and I'm like, show me where that actually happened. Oh, and right. so I wanted to show my work. Uh, and so I talked to Amato and we ended up kind of taking the throwing out, not throwing out, but uh, putting on hold the mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies part, and just looking at everything else because those things did have received very little attention. And when I say those things, I mean things like beetles, ants, uh, aphids, daphnia. So mostly uh, terrestrials. Uh, terrestrials, but I mean, there's a whole bunch of, of aquatics too. I mean, Daphnia, bait fish, water, water, boatman? water boatman's a huge one. I mean, water boatman, that's a, that's a classic, uh, classic one. So the story of the water boatman, um, in my writing was, was really clear, clear. Once you start reading more and more about them, um, you look and you look at the flash patterns that we see in shops and you're like, how does this even, how do these two mesh? Um, when water boatmen stop swimming, they float up because they carry a plaster on of air on their bodies, which they breathe from. They breathe atmospheric oxygen. They don't have gills. And so they grab that bubble of air at the surface, and then they swim down. Whenever And whenever they stop, they float up. But how, when you go into a fly shop, how many times do you see a bead-headed water boatman <laughs> or a weighted water boatman all the time? And so, uh, you know, that led me to design some water boatman patterns with foam bodies, and you fish them on a sinking line, and and a short leader and you fish them in under five feet of water because water boatmen um, almost never are found in water deeper than five, five feet because mm-hmm. if they land in water deeper than five feet, they get eaten because <laughs> oh. they can't get to, they can't get to the bottom, get to, to uh, protection. Huh. So it, yeah, that's a tip, a biological tip. If you fish water boatmen, do it in two to five feet of water. No, and yeah, I guess there are, I'm trying to think of some water boatmen patterns. I guess there are a few out there. Yeah, and I've got, I think I have four in the book, oh, wow. um, four different ones. So yeah, that was the kind of the approach: take a, a serious scientific look at, at these foods that we, you know, marginally imitate or we kind of haphazardly imitate, and, and really put the same kind of thought that Lafontaine and and Hughes and and, and Boyle and, and these other um, people put toward their insects. Gotcha. Okay, and, and are any of those oddballs, could you name a few that would also be good? Did you talk about small streams in in that book as well? Yeah, the crane flies are, are, are a big one uh, for small streams, probably the biggest. Um, ants, of course, which we already talked about. Beetles, beetles are the most numerous creature on Earth. There's more, a quarter of all species on Earth are beetles. And so, you know, a lot of our fly patterns that are, attractors i i'm guessing trout assume there's some sort of beetle that they've seen before um and so i always carry a huge array of beetles for my small stream fishing um during the summertime beetles will make up 40 percent of the calories that a trout eats on, on a lot of small streams um another small stream bug that's really important is and it's also a big stream bug uh, is black fly larva oh yeah black fly larva are probably the most misunderstood misunderstood trout food uh in the world and there's a couple of reasons why number one black fly larvae don't emerge on the surface they emerge totally formed as adults in an air bubble on the bottom and they rocket to the surface and they take off without drifting hmm. and so there's no kind of hatch 
uh, per se of, of black flies. And they also don't have a hatch period because they go through four to 10 generations a year. Uh, there's always some that are hatching. So it's not like a, a stonefly hatch where they're there for two weeks and then gone for the rest of the year. Yeah. So they're always around. Um, another reason why we mistake them is that, uh, or ignore them is that there's no egg laying period. They lay their eggs on the margins of like rocks and stuff in riffles. So, um, you know, there's no return like there is, there's no spinner fall. And then the larva are kind of small, wormy. They look like micro caddis. So a lot of people confuse them with micro caddis and yeah, they're, they're just extremely important. When, when, and then even when people look at scientific studies or, or reports from ODFNW or WDFW about uh, trout streams, they see diptera in there and they think diptera, well, that's, that's true flies. Okay. So that includes a whole bunch of different creatures that trout eat, including chironomids. And so a lot of people think, oh, diptera, chironomids, no. but in streams, diptera, uh, oftentimes are, are black fly larvae. Oh, wow. So the larvae are really, really, really important. Small, size 20, uh, black grub, super simple, uh, just a couple turns of black hair tron, wire rib, and that's it. Mm-hmm. And I just, I fish those all the time, small streams. And they're also really, really common in big rivers. Anywhere where you have a lot of sediment, um, they are filter feeders, just like net spinning caddis are. So uh, anywhere you find net spinning caddis, pack some black fly larvae. They oh, take cool. you, you, tie, you can tie a year's supply in a half hour. So it's, a, so you're, it's kind of a midge looking fly. That, yep. Yeah, it's, then... it's a little thicker than a midge though. You know, uh, if you're trying to size 20 midge, you're just going to be going thread body, uh, wire rib, just yeah. really, really sparse. Yeah. But, but with this, yeah, a little bit of bulk is good. Oh, okay. when you look at the naturals on the rock, they're kind of grubby looking. Gotcha. They're grubby. Okay. And what would be the technique if you're on the small stream? Are you fishing under an indicator? Like if you're going to fish the nymphs, how, how would you typically, or is there just a bunch of different ways to do it? With the nymphs, I, I'm a, I'm a big anti hopper dropper guy. Um, anti, if anti, yeah, I think, if, I think it's the worst of both worlds. Um, and the reason why is that you're, you're not fishing your nymph as effectively as you could be. Your nymph's not getting right to the bottom. Most of the time, usually you're drifting too high and your dry fly is getting dragged by your nymph and vice versa. Yeah. And so uh, I'm much more, if I'm going to fish a nymph, I'm going to check nymph it. Um, if I can, uh, but I'll put it under an indicator with some weight and make sure I get it down quickly. Cause you know, in a small stream, uh, you don't have the distance for the fly to get down to the bottom, you know, fishing yep. the Deschutes, you can roll cast it and it can drift for six, seven, eight feet before it can get down deep. Uh, in a small stream, you don't have six, seven, eight feet, you've got a foot. And mm-hmm. so you got to get the tungsten and have an indicator and, and, uh, get underneath it. So either, either fish an indicator or check nymph. Okay. And is that in the Czech NIF, is that just similar to the European, any of the European style? Yeah. I, I used, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm way old school when it comes to that. I was, I had Czech nymphs in my, my first book on the Oregon Cascades back in 1999, uh, way before it became a, a yeah. thing. Um, and so I always call it Czech nymphing, but yeah, Euro nymphing style, there's a whole bunch of different varieties, but uh, in Oregon streams, I'm usually going with the Czech nymph style. And is a Czech, if you had to pick a fly pattern, it's just a really sparse, doesn't really imitate much of anything. It's just kind of a, it's got a little hot spot maybe in it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it can have a hot spot. It, you can, it can be either really sparse, like a French nymph or uh, grubby looking like a more traditional Czech, Czech nymph. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's, that's good. Yeah. I've had a, a few guests that have been pretty big euro but uh, on the usa team and stuff like that and yeah every time i every time i put euro nymphing in any of the titles or anywhere in the, any of the podcast stuff well the cool thing is apple now is actually um they're indexing the audio now so as we talk apple is indexing so right now the fact that i say euro nymphing oh it boom it just so uh, yeah so this <laughs> is gonna shoot up line. a thousand there's <laughs> there'll be a thousand more listeners probably because i just Jeez. said euro nymphing but uh, no, it, it's it's interesting to me because I'm I'm old school and you know you were ahead of the game for sure. But back in you know ninety nine two thousands whatever, man, I had no idea. And I, I guess what I was doing was kind of similar because we always fished. I was taught to fish without an indicator, just a straight line. But you know we were using built leaders and they weren't thin, you know, very thin. So I know I wasn't getting down to the fish a lot. Um, yeah. So. 
but um but yeah so in the stream so you're out there and would you say you're doing as much nymphing as dry fly fishing in the small in the small streams no it depends on the season um if i'm fishing early or late i i'm more likely to to nymph if, if it's a high water uh high water is also a great time to be on small streams um especially you know this time of year um you know we think you know days like we just had a big mm-hmm. dumping of rain here in the portland area and a lot of people say well i don't I, the river's blowing out. I don't want to fish. Um, but if you look at when trout eat during the winter time, uh, throughout the early spring, it coincides with, with flooding situations. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So, uh, the fish will move to marginal areas. Um, and after a day or two getting used to whatever sediments in the water and the flow, they, they start feeding, uh, pretty aggressively. So, um, even when you have high water like this, it's a good time, good time to get out and nip. But during the summertime, I'm pretty much on, on terrestrials, um, you know, on yeah. most of my small streams. So, okay. Unless there's a specific hatch going on, I'm usually throwing an ant or a beetle. Gotcha. And as you look back at, you know, again, for somebody that maybe is new to the small streams, any other tips or anything you want to throw out there that might help somebody find some fish? I'm, I'm just thinking again, where you, you already said a bunch, you know, finding the rocks and boulders and the resource to Tom Rosenbauer. It sounds like he's got a good book. Um, anything else we're missing here? Um, well, I, I always tell people fish, fish a longer leader and a longer rod than you probably associate with small streams. If you're fishing mm-hmm. open small streams, open canopy small streams, which tend to be the better ones, uh, in, in the West Coast, if you have a closed canopy uh, small stream with a lot of conifers over it, yeah. odds are it's not going to be very productive. Not many bugs. Um, not many bugs, exactly. Water's too cold, no algae growth. Yeah. Um, but if you're fishing open canopy, open water, you know, I see a lot of people come to small streams and they've got the seven foot rod and you're fishing, you know, in a windy Wyoming open small stream. And it's yeah. like, you got, you know, my favorite is like a, a 11 foot, I've got an 11 foot four weight Winston oh, wow. that I, that I foot, um, just love to throw. Um, and, uh, and I fish long leaders. I fish as long as you can cast is, is my rule. So oh. I, I often fish like a 15 foot leader no kidding. on small streams. Um, because mostly because if, you know, the less line you have on the water, the longer the drift you're probably going to get. And so, um, mm-hmm. yeah, I've, especially meadow small streams where you're, you're trying to not spook fish. Um, yeah, I fish long leaders. So what do your leaders um, look like? What, what side, like, how are you building it? Or are you just getting, a, I usually, you know, I use, uh, those airflow, um, mm-hmm. poly leaders, poly leaders. And, and I, I got a whole bunch from Ray Jeff back, yep. gosh, like in 2004 when I was still kind of in the, in the business mm-hmm. and, uh, and I'm still working through some of those, but, sure. uh, and then I, into that attack on another, you know, eight feet. So I have like a nine foot and then maybe six, seven more feet to taper down to a, you know, whatever's, whatever's reasonable. I used to be crazy about fishing super light tippets, but, uh, in my old age, I'm, I'm, you know, trying to fish the heaviest tippets I can. Yep. So I, I'll, I'll fish like a five X most of the time. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So pretty standard stuff. That's, well, that's good. The 11 foot rod though. That's definitely a longer, that's almost into a, a, a trout space size rod. It's it, it is. And it helps you fight the wind. It helps you control your line. It lets you check nymph a lot better. I mean, you're able to, to, to access more water. Uh, it's just a, it's just a better tool mm-hmm. for the job. You know, small rods are great. I've got a, a, old St. Croix Imperial seven footer yep. two two weight that, that I, I love to play with on little coastal streams. But, uh, if I'm, if I'm out in Montana or Wyoming or Idaho and fishing big water, not big water, but big, big sky, yeah, uh, big open, sky. open canopy areas. I want something I can fight the wind with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, we're, uh, I think we're going to start to wrap this up here. I, uh, I've got, uh, actually another episode that I'm going to be getting ready for here. So this is about right. So I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, the, the, the 222, which I always go into. We mentioned, you mentioned a couple of flies and some tips there. As far as resources, anything else, you know, that would be good for small streams, book, magazine, videos, anything that might help somebody dig into other than, uh, Rosenbauer's book? And that's pretty much the Bible. It sounds like for small. Well, well it, it, it's just yeah, just well. His is just um, reading trout water is his book, and I, I think that's just a, a, a principle because on small streams, it, reading trout water is, is paramount. If you can't read the water, you're not going to get anything. On big waters, you know the features are huge and they're hard to miss. But on a small stream, they, they can be easy to miss and easy to overlook. And so, if you're not a 
a pro at reading the water. That's a great resource to, mm-hmm. to start with. Um, uh, in terms of other resources, what, what, I, I don't really, what oh, about on the book? I was going to say, what about on, uh, the, the bug you mentioned your book that was like 600 and what did that turn out to be? How many pages when you, Oh, I think it was about 200. Yeah. So you dropped or about a hundred, hundred, 140 or so. Uh, so ha- it's very, it's very text rich though. Yeah. Um, so you dropped it way down. What, I mean, what are, I have a few entomology books in there, including hay fleas and stuff like that, but is there one entomology or one book that's just kind of the Bible for that, that realm? Um, I, you know, I still, I still think La Fontaine's yeah. Caddisflies in, in terms of just like thought and thinking about yeah. fly fishing is probably the most important. Um, yeah. I, I really, I mean, Hayfley is, is comprehensive and Hughes is comprehensive. Um, Schulmeyer has a lot of great picture books. Uh, if you want to see some good images of bugs, uh, Pe- people talk about, Arlen, yeah, go ahead. Arlen Thomason has a, has a really good mayfly book. Um, but in terms of like, thinking about fly fishing and it's i don't see that type of kind of philosophical um no approach to fly fishing very often and it's it's really remarkable and so i i encourage anybody who has not read cast flies to to read it read it a couple times Mm because it's just the thought the the way he approaches the sport is is certainly unique and now when I, i look at a lot of his patterns i think that doesn't make sense but when you read his thinking behind it Sure, that fly might not have come out looking like a million bucks, but the thinking behind it probably made him a better fisherman. Yeah, yeah, he was way so. ahead. He was way ahead of his time. Yeah. Okay, cool. And uh, so let's see. And I was, and I'll note in the show notes any of the links we, you know, the stuff we talked about. I'll put everything in the show notes, including a couple. I have a couple animalology books. I can't remember the names of the title, but one of them's a, a, a you know, spiral bounded kind of a guide, you know, your normal kind of uh, guide right. in Malgy. I got a couple. So I'll put those links in. Um, and then what about as far as, you know, like uh, small streams, any other gear, anything else other than your typical stuff? I mean, are you using just all your normal vests and the, all that stuff? Yeah, I uh, I, I usually carry a, a mesh vest or a, or a sling. Um, actually, now I have a, a hip pack, a Sims hip pack that mm-hmm. I really like. Um, is that, the water, is that one of those waterproof fully? Yeah, one of the yeah. waterproof ones because, you know, you can always fall. That's the thing you got to remember in small streams. You know, you're more likely to slip and fall there than you are on big water. Do you um, remember what the name of that, that little pack is? I don't. Yeah. I, I'm i not a gear person, but it's... I'll put, I mean, a, I'll put a link in the show Is it the G3 notes. model? I don't, I don't know. I'll, I'll try to, after maybe after this call, we can get that just so I can put a link in so somebody can take a look at what that one is. But it's a great, it's a great little pack. And then... Um, uh, I, I'm a big fan of, of Corker's boots. Mm-hmm. Now I used to, I, I love my Sims guide boot. Um, that I, you, I had a couple pairs, uh, early in the two thousands. Uh, but when I go to Yellowstone now, you got to have the yeah uh, no. uh, rubber soles and mm-hmm. I, and I, you know, fish two weeks in Yellowstone every year at least. So, uh, that makes it easy to switch back and forth. And also if you're duck hunting, you know, you can put on the, the rubber instead of your felt and, uh, and you can switch in and out pretty easy. So, Mm-hmm. Um, but other than that, I don't wear waders when I fish small streams. Almost all the, almost all the time I, I wet wade and that's partially because I, I like to feel in touch with the water. Um, you know, in Yellowstone, that's particularly important because you can tell where springs are and that you wouldn't notice if you're oh, just looking yeah. at the water. There you go. So you can good kind tip. of feel that and it's, and it's something good to go back to mm-hmm. later in the season or early in the season, uh, to know where those springs are. Uh, but also it's, you're more flexible. It's easier to move, less likely to fall. Have you uh, seen, I, uh, do you, do you know, uh, the ascent fly fishing, uh, 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 Pete, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the name of the thing, but he has a, a thermometer that straps to your uh, boot kind of goes in somehow into your laces. So you can always kind of check the temperature. as you're That's going. a great idea. That's, yeah. that's something I need to, I should have, you should, we should have talked about this about four weeks ago. Put that on my Chris, Christmas Christmas. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a Pete. He's actually, he's on our, one of our sponsored, uh, one of our sponsor or sponsored company. So yeah, he, he's got some good stuff over there. He's a big energy. He's kind of the, I think of him as the, well, he's a biologist, but I think of him kind of as the, you know, the biologist slash entomologist, kind of the everyday guy. Nice. Yeah. So, okay. So now, yeah, finish that thought. So you're saying basically just, yeah, that makes sense. Get the temperature and then you just record that in your GPS or make a mental note. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, with, with smartphones now, it's, it's a lot easier to take notes and, and journals are really important. You know, when I did my first, uh, 
book and then the second book, you know, a lot of the, the information I got there was from journaling um, and trying to create a system of, of recording information, uh, you know, hatches, hours I fished, numbers of fish I caught, fly patterns that worked, fly patterns that didn't work, uh, taking note of that at the time because otherwise it can just turn into mush in your brain, uh, especially if you get out more than once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, looking for trends that way can also be uh, productive. Okay. And do you have, before you let us, uh, before you get out of here, a, a history? Do you have a, a kind of a fun fact or history or something that comes to mind or maybe a, a president or somebody you studied over your, your years there? Oh, my favorite fun fact that um, I always like to tell people about hunting is that the reason why we have hunter safety laws is, you know, our big boom in hunting was not uh, in colonial times. It wasn't like a, a tradition that was passed directly down from our revolutionary no. forefathers. It was something that was learned in World War II um, because you took people from all over the country, you took young men uh, and put them into a very – uh, what we call homo social, just it's all men uh, environment um, for years. And then they learn how to shoot and they do what guys do in their early twenties. You know, they're shooting the crap and, and drinking beer and, and, and living like young men do. And then all of a sudden they come back to post-war jobs, homes in suburbia, huge families, and they miss those times. And so, Hunting was what in the 50s in particular was a way of veterans to kind of reconnect with with Hmm. the memories of their past. And that we saw the numbers of hunters explode in the 1950s. Um, And a lot of it had to do with the fact that you took people from New York City and you took an Italian kid from New York City. You take a Jewish Hmm. kid from Chicago. You take an Irish kid from Boston. You take a, a, a german american kid from from texas and you take a southerner from from georgia and you put them all in the same barracks together and you get these city kids that never heard about hunting and you have these kids from the south and the west and in the midwest oh, yeah. talking talking about hunting and uh they're like oh, i'd like to do that someday and then when they all move to the suburbs together you know the rural people move to the suburbs the city people move out to the suburbs um hunting became a way of of, of them getting into it uh, but the thing is everyone knew how to shoot but nobody knew how to hunt and so we saw massive amounts of people getting killed in places like Michigan and no Minnesota. Kidding. Yeah. We, uh, one year in Pennsylvania, I think in 1950, uh, 1957, 14 people were killed hunting. Well, and that's just by kind of like you, something moves and you shoot in the bushes. Yeah. And yeah. Somebody. Yeah. And, and, and you, you've been out drinking all night oh and, my gosh, uh, yeah. and up with the boys and, and, and something moves and you shoot it. And so, wow. um, so all of our, hunter safety regulations uh, emerged in the late 1950s because, I mean, I, one year I think the peak was like 290 hunters died Jeez. during hunting season. Now, I, I mean, nowadays it's something like 15, 18. It, it's still some so, I know because I remember some stories back in high school where hearing friends of friends that, you know, yeah, getting their cowboy hats shot off and stuff like that. So it's still, yeah, it hasn't gone away completely yet. No. Yeah. So that's okay. Well, that's a good, that's a good fun fact. Um, and then is there a, uh, just one takeaway from today, anything that we talked about that, you know, you think was a real, should be a focus for the small streams or anything else we missed? Is it, do we, we covered a little bit, a little bit on it. Um, it sounds like it's pretty straightforward. Is is that the case? Yeah, no, it's, it, you know, small stream fishing, you just got to take it as seriously as you take uh, a trip to any other water you know you, it just can't be dismissed a, as a as a simple place for simple small fish mm-hmm. uh, if you think like that yeah you, you're going to continue to catch small fish yeah. on small streams but if you if you approach it with the same type of preparation uh and analytics and care uh and thoughtfulness that you do when you make a trip to the henry's fork and make a trip to green river make a trip to bighorn um you're going to find more success cool Cool. And, uh, and in the next, uh, six months or so, anything uh, new we can expect from you in the, you know, personally or professionally here and with what you got going? Well, I'm, I have some book projects I'm still working on. Um, but, uh, I'm going to try to get on a couple trips. We're going to be going to France in late, uh, May. So I'm hoping to do some, uh, French sniffing over there oh, cool. and, and get, try a couple of rivers there in Southern France. So. Right on. Right on. Sounds like, uh, sounds like a good time. Yep. Cool. And uh, people can find you just uh, jmorganflyfishing at gmail.com. Yep. That's the best way to reach me. All right. Well, hopefully maybe a few people will reach out to you and check in with you on this. It's definitely an interesting thing for uh, for me. I haven't, you know, I've kind of been in that realm. I've never really dug into the small creeks for kind of the, some of the same things you're talking about. So 
So it might be a good a good chance. I got a couple of new rods for the kids here this year too. So I think they would love, you know, getting out on some small streams. So so this is going to get me fired up, Jeff. Thanks for coming on, awesome. and share, sharing all your uh, your tips and knowledge, and I'll, I'll link out to everything we talked about today and, and keep in touch with you. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, Dave. Okay, see ya. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we covered, just go to wetplayswing.com slash one two zero. If you want to find some winter steelhead this year with me, and then head over to wetflyswing.com slash OP and I'll send you some extra bonus deal t- details there. I want to read a quick review from Apple Podcasts. This comes from Brew City North. Brew City North says, Great podcast and show notes. Five stars. Awesome podcast. I listen to a lot of fishing podcasts, and Dave is an awesome host. He keeps things laid back and unpretentious. I especially appreciate his show notes and the way he breaks them down to the minute. Hey, uh, Bruce City North, uh, that is amazing. I appreciate your support. I thank you for leaving those kind words. Um, definitely reinforces the fact that there's uh, some benefit from how I'm doing this, so I appreciate that. Um, this is stuff that keeps me going strong, and uh, and without it, I think, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't be uh, possibly not even out there right now. So keep uh, keep that coming and keep the feedback coming to let me know. You can reach out anytime. If you have ideas for show notes, Dave at wetflyswing.com. Head over to uh, uh, wetflyswing.com slash show to see the entire back catalog, including all the show notes uh, we noted here. And just click, it, click any of the links there and you can take a look at all the detailed show notes. Okay. Thanks for stopping by the show today. Look forward to uh, maybe seeing you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. 